Well, good morning. Good morning. Long time no see. <laughs> it's been about 30 seconds. Um, all right, first I want to just take a minute to say thank you for everybody that came out this morning. I'm so glad to see all of you here. Uh, I'm thankful for the support. And this looks, this section over here looks about like a family reunion, about the first three rows and over here. So if, if you don't recognize these people, they're kin to me, so forgive them. <laughs> we need it. Um, I thought and prayed and thought and prayed about what to preach on the first Sunday that I was going to be taking over a church as head pastor. And I thought and prayed about what to preach. And for uh, some reason, and it's not me, so don't think, oh, this guy's smart, because I'm not that smart. So God does great things. Let me say that right up the bat. So the, the passage that came to mind was, um, Haggai and Haggai was a prophet and he was a prophet during the time when they were trying to rebuild a temple because the temple had fallen and it was like they had to start all over again and you know in a way with Pastor Dan leaving and me stepping up it's like we have to start all over again we have to, we have to rebuild the temple uh, so at but earlier in the week, the name of the sermon was Rebuilding the Temple. And then as I'm working on the sermon, working on the sermon, thinking about it, and, that, and then I was like, no, the, the Ken and I were texting yesterday, and just yesterday I changed the title to Begin Again. Because that's what this is about. It start, it's about beginning again. You know, starting over. A fresh start, a, a brand new beginning. And in a way, that's what was happening back in these days. So now that I've given a little introduction and I'm coming down a little bit from the worship because I was all excited up here, I'm going to pray that God would bless the, his word and that we would understand what he's trying to say through it and then we'll get started. So, Father, right now, we thank you for the worship that we've had. We thank you for the music. We thank you for the singing. We thank you for your presence here in this place. And now we invite you to take this place over. Take this place over with your word and with your spirit in our hearts that our ears would hear and that our hearts would listen and change us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So first of all, we're just going to start by reading a little bit out of uh, Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 3. It is, Who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel. I worked on that all week. Declares the Lord, be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak. I worked on that one too. I had to listen to it. The high priest, be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. We're going to skip. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I coveted, coveted with you when you came out of Egypt. I didn't work on that one, you can tell. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. And then he goes on to say one more thing. What does it say? The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, if that don't get your blood pumping just by reading it. Um, I, told, I told the worship team this morning I need to get me a handkerchief so I can get Baptist up here and start <laughs> dancing around and rubbing my head. Get excited, but we're not going to quite go that far. I may jump off the stage, but Paula says she was going to push me back up here. So, now you guys know me. I like to set the stage. I like to talk about context. I like to take what was being said to the people it was being said to, and then take from that and understand what God's trying to tell us, because He's speaking to a totally different group of people back in a certain time about a certain thing. So there's certain things we have to take literally, and there's certain things we have to take figuratively. And to understand that, we've got to know 
what was happening, what was going on. It's called context. So to build a little context, um, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Israel about 587 B.C. He took over. He just wiped out the country. He wiped out the, the temple. And the temple was Solomon's temple. So Solomon's temple to the Jews was like the Mount St. Helens. It was the Holy Grail. It was the top of the top. It was the best thing ever because Solomon was granted riches beyond belief. There was gold. There was, I mean, it was just this huge, gorgeous temple. And, and, the, and the Jews like coveted this thing. It, was, it almost had become their God over God. So then Nebuchadnezzar wipes out Israel, destroys the temple. About, I don't know, about 537-ish. If you read the book of Ezra, chapter 1, King Cyrus of Persia allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And here's the passage. I don't have it up there. I'm just going to read it to you. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. So the Jews were in captivity. Then the, the king of Persia decides, I'm going to let them go, start rebuilding their temple. And there's a whole lot to that story. I'm not going to go back into it. There was some, a lot of other stuff happening there. But basically, they were granted papers to leave and go get materials and build the temple. They started building the temple. Well, um, about 537, the altar was repaired and the foundations of the temple began sometime around 537 B.C. And if you're not catching this, we're counting backwards because it's B.C., <laughs> so, so about 537, then the Samaritan. Now, I want you to notice something here, though. I was doing some research, and we have a story about a good Samaritan that we preach a lot about. But here's part of the reason the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. Um, the Samaritans' opposition halted the construction about 536. So, so the, the people outside... We're not liking the idea of the Jews getting their temple back. So they were messing with them. They were giving them a hard time. They were not letting them do what they were supposed to do. Uh, then the work on the house basically just stopped. And it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Uh, the project languished for 16 years and it restarted in 520 B.C. So about this time in history is where Haggai comes into the story. So they had been letting free to go build the temple. They had been charged by the king. The, the, all rights were their rights to build the temple. They moved back in. They started on it. They built the foundations, and then it just stopped. And um, it stopped because they were getting opposition from their neighbors. It stopped because of all these other things. We're going to look at some of those things. Why did they stop building the temple? Well, and, and then here's where we can start to translate it to something we can understand. Why do we stop working on our temple? Trouble from the world around them. The Samaritans. Now, I find it unique here that when you're doing research and we learn that the Samaritans were an enemy of God's people, and then a little later, Jesus uses the Samaritans as a hero in his story. That should make you think a little bit about when you read something and understand what Jesus is really trying to do about love and forgiveness and, and, and other people. But that's not the sermon this morning. We'll get back to that. So one of the things that stopped them was troubles from the world around them. Same way with us. We may be doing good. We may be, may be going to church or reading our Bible or whatever. But troubles from the world around us makes us stop what about some thought the time wasn't right it's just not right to finish it's not right yet if if god was in it it would be easy 
if it wouldn't be hard. It, it, things would be better if God was trying to make us do this. We wouldn't be any trouble. We wouldn't be having trouble from the people around us. It's just not the right time right now. Have any of you ever said that to yourself? What about they were discouraged because they thought the new temple would never reach what the old temple was. They said there's no way that this temple can ever be as good as Solomon's temple. There's no way. There's no possible way. Do you remember what Solomon's temple looked like? The walls were so big. There was so much gold. It was the best temple that we've ever seen in our life. There's no way that the new temple can get to that place. Just look at it. The foundation's not even as big as the last one. They were discouraged. How many of us get discouraged because we think the future's never going to be as bright as the past was? They were worried more about their own affairs. If you read back in chapter 1 of Haggai, Haggai, he actually writes a little rebuke to the people and says, why are you working on your own house when God's house is not finished? You're worried about your own affairs and the Lord's house lays in disrepair and ruin. And a lot of times the same thing happens with us. We get worried with everyday things of life. We get caught up in... You know, what time we got to be at work and the kids got to make it to soccer practice and, and I, there's all kinds of things and they're not bad things. Is it bad to have a nice house or to have a house that's in, in good condition? No. But what Haggai was saying was don't let that consume you so much that you don't do what God's calling you to do. All right. So that's why they stopped. And then here's what, what were the consequences of them stopping and giving up? This is another place that we can take the principles and translate them into things that mean something to us. So one of the consequences, because they stopped, God stopped blessing the harvest. And the harvest failed. So they were, they were struggling. They were working on their own house, trying to build their own house. But then they're also starving because... The harvest is failing. Well, then that just snowballs it, right? Is that what happens to us? The one little thing happens and we start focusing on, on the problem instead of the solution. And then the other thing happens and we start focusing more on the problem instead of the solution. And the next thing happens and before you know it, you don't even see the solution anymore. Only the problem. Their finances were not blessed. Of course, if the harvest fails, they're farmers. They're not going to have any money if they don't have any crops to sell. They don't have any money because they don't have crops. They don't have food to buy because they don't have money. Again, it's the snowball effect. What else happened because of them giving up? And here's the, here's the big one. They became inwardly focused. They became inwardly focused. It, they became in survival mode. Now, any of you lifeguards in here? Anybody a lifeguard? All right. I know somebody here that has some lifeguard training, but I will not make her stand up and testify. <laughs> lifeguard, they will teach you that if somebody's fighting from drowning, they're trying to stay on top of the water, you have to let them stop fighting before you grab a hold of them. Because they will knock you down and drag you under with them. And some real heavy-duty lifeguards will teach you that if they won't stop fighting, you knock them out. Now that sounds harsh. But if two of you are in the ocean and both of you go down, then you didn't succeed at your job. If two of you are in the ocean and both of you come out and one of you has a black eye, you still succeeded at your job. Right? So, 
When we talk about becoming inwardly fo- focused and talk about staying in survival mode, sometimes we just get in this wailing survival. We're trying to just stay afloat and everything's closing in on us and it's the bills and it's the kids and it's, the, and it's everything. And sometimes God has to knock us out for no sense of better words. Sometimes we have to hit the bottom. Sometimes we have to stumble and fall. Sometimes he allows something to happen in our life to jolt us back to reality. Well, that's what had happened to the Jews. They were up in this big, huge temple, and everything's going great, and they get caught up in the whole, hey, we're great, we've got... And God lets Nebuchadnezzar come in and wipe them out. Then they get blessed, and they get to go back and start again. And they're started again, they're excited, and then there's a little bit of trouble, and they're like, ah, oh, here we go again. We're never going to make it. And then Haggai comes in and he says these words. He says, be strong. So here's where we're at. We know why they stopped. They stopped because they were, there was troubles from all around. They stopped because they just didn't think it was the right time. They stopped because they were discouraged that it wasn't going to be as good as the last one. Or the, the, new, the new one would never make it as good. Glorious is the last one. And they were just worried about their own affairs. And their consequences was their harvest failed, their finances failed, and they became inwardly focused. So what's the answer? And let me just stop right here and say this. We've all been there. There's not one person in this place, in in any seat in here, that hasn't reached a point in their life where they said, I got to start all over. I just, I I can't do it like this anymore. I'm just, I got to begin again. And so that's what Haggai was trying to get the people to understand. So the first point I want to make, and these points are right out of the scripture, and I love it when that happens because then it makes my job easy. I just have to put the point up there and, and then I just say, couple words about it and you guys go oh yeah I never saw that and that's great and then then I can say God did his job and I didn't have to do anything so the first point is renew your strength what is the answer for when we're at that place where we're at the very end where we're drowning and we're flailing trying to just stay above water Haggai says renew your strength says God says be strong Zerubbabel Zerubbabel Thank you. Declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Now, this be strong, does it mean that I'm all of a sudden going to be able to pick up a thousand pounds? You could almost translate this to take heart. Be encouraged. You know, be strong. It's not going to be easy. But you can do it. And the the picture that I get here is if you're a a father or a mother and you've got that child that's just learning how to walk and they get up to the couch and they get the little wobbly leg thing on. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Right? And the parents are like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Knowing all along that they're probably not going to make but three or four steps and fall over, but you're excited. And you're like, man, once they start walking, they'll never believe the world that they have in their hands once they can walk. And so we could encourage them as parents, come on, you can do it. Just take that other step. Just come on, you can do it. And so this be strong is like that. God's saying, be strong. You will not believe what's on the other side of that first step. You will not believe what's coming next after you can run. You will not believe what's coming next after you can can jump. And he's saying, be strong. Maybe you don't have the strength yet, but take heart. You can do it. And then here's the one. And work. So first we got to renew our strength. And then he calls us to 
Work. Rededicate your hands. Renew your strength and then rededicate your hands. If you go back and read chapter 1, he's telling them to go get the, the trees from the, from the mountains and bring it down to build the temple. And there is a, there's an aspect of God, what he's wanting to do in us and through us that takes us putting our hands to the plow and grabbing hold. There's, a, there's, there's an aspect. Now, we can get all spiritual and say, you know, God's working in me. But, but God wants to work through you. And until you put your hands on it and get your hands rededicated to it, then we're not doing all that He's called us to do because He wants us to rededicate those hands. So the, the rededicate your hands, it says, and work. Start. Somewhere. Pick, pick something and start. It could be little it could be a small thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rededicate to read this Bible for five minutes every day. I'm going to rededicate to go to the homeless shelter. I'm going to rededicate. What is it? What is it? Because all of us have our different skills and different. It's what is it that he's called you to do? Where are you going to put your hands to the plow? And that's what, he, that's what Haggai was telling the people of Israel. And that's what God's telling us. And we... To be strong, renew our strength, and rededicate our hands. Then he says, and this one's a good one for me. This is where it starts to get exciting. Remember my, his promise. This is what I coveted to you with when you came out of Egypt. What did he promise? Has anybody in, read the end of the book yet? <laughs> Have you read the end of the book? I think he wins. Right? <laughs> There's all kinds of promises in there that says, hey, if you trust me, if you follow me, you take up heart, it's going to be good for you here. But ultimately, that's not the goal. Ultimately, the goal is him, his glory. But his promise says that I coveted this with you thousands of years ago before you were born. And you're just the promise. And that promise still lies with you. So renew your strength, rededicate your hands, and trust me, I'm right there. I've promised this to you. The next one goes right along with this one. It says, rest in his spirit. It says, I coveted this with you and my spirit is with you. This is the one that we always forget as Christians. Because this is the one that we put last most of the time instead of first. Because why? We want to do it first ourselves. We want to, and we had this conversation in the uh, first board meeting we had uh, the other week, and uh, last this week, this past week. And uh, this conversation was, we like to come into a board meeting or we like to come into our life or like to come into a situation and we like to go, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to do. God, will you please bless it? And we had this conversation that we didn't want to do that this time. We wanted to come into the board meeting to go, God, what do you want us to do? These are the situations and the things that we feel could help, could, but we want to pray about that for a month. We want to think about that for a while. We want to decide. And uh, literally, we, gave, we handed out empty notebooks and empty prayer books. And we wrote down, these are the things we're thinking about and praying about. And, and we wrote it in a prayer book. And then we have empty notebooks. While we're praying, we're going to make notes. And what we're doing is trying to put rest in His Spirit. And this is the one that really matters because His people couldn't do it in their own hands, their own strength, and their own power. But He's reminding them, 
I've promised this is going to be true. You don't have to worry about all those problems around. I promised you, and my spirit will be with you. And then here's the other one. Refuse to fear. Now this one, we think about not being scared or being courageous. A lot of people think courage is the absence of fear. And that is absolutely not true. Courage is the ability to act even though you're scared. Right? So God says it may be scary. It's not going to be easy. But don't fear. Do not fear. Because my Spirit is with you. My promise is on you. Take strength. You can do it. It's time to begin again. So, we talked about the, the five points that I want you to remember. And so what will be the result? What will be the result if we do things God's way? If we do the, the, the things that He's uh, teaching us? And so what I wanted to share with you about the Scripture... And I love this passage of Scripture because the points are right there. I didn't have to force any of those points out of the Scripture. Did everybody see that? It was just, all we had to do was break it down and read what it was saying. And this is one of those Scriptures, if you start to get into Bible study, this is one of those things that, that teachers will tell you, is there a cause and effect in this Scripture? Is there a, here's something I say, this is what will happen if you do what I say. They, they call that a cause and effect relationship. And you start studying the Bible, I want you to look for those things. Do, does God's promise come with a result? And this passage is one of those that does. It's great. Um, um, if you go back, let's do, here's the next point. If we do things God's way, if we listen to what He says, if we take our strength, if we renew our hands, renew our strength, rest in His Spirit, refuse to fear, and rest in His promise, these are the things that will happen. God will move the immovable. If you look at that cause and effect, He says, I will shake the nations. I will shake the nations. And this right here is prophecy to what's coming. When He says that the thing that all nations desire He's talking about Jesus. So, God can move the immovable. God will do, here's the, here's the one I like. God will do much more with far less. The gold is mine, the silver is mine. Now what this reference was to, was to the old temple. Because they were discouraged about the old temple, that it was so grand and beautiful and all the gold and all the adornments in the old temple. And the new temple was not going to have that because they were a broke people. And what God was saying is, it's not about the gold. It's not about the silver. Because why? God's new is much better than our old. Because what God was saying when, he, when Haggai spoke and he said that the new temple will be far greater than the old, it was a prophecy about Jesus again. Because this was the temple where Jesus would stand and preach. This was the temple where Jesus would drive out the money changers. This was the temple that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil would split down the middle. This coming temple was not the physical building. The coming temple was Jesus Christ. And the last thing, if we do things God's way, is God's peace will be upon you. There, it, it may not be absence of trouble, an absence of problems, an absence of the things around you, and and absence of the feeling like you're drowning, but there's going to be a peace there that says, I know this is the right thing. 
Because this is what God's called me to. I know this is the right place because this is where God's called me. So in just a review, I want you to remember this. Renew your strength. Remember His promise. Rest in His Spirit and refuse to fear. Now, one more thing I like to do that I want to get in the habit of trying to do is that coming in here and listening to a message and listening to reading the Bible and all that is great. But if we stop there, then we've done nothing. So what we need to get in the habit of as Christians, as people that, that want to follow God's word, we need to learn how to apply this stuff. So if I could give you one application this week to go out and do this coming week that will help apply what we just learned, I'm doing a better job of teaching you. Because if we hear it and don't do it, then we might as well not have heard it. So I just made a little list of things. Application. And, and this is where, you know, we, we, we learn what the Bible said to who it said it to first. And we got context and then we got the meaning from the, the Scriptures and took away from that what we're supposed to hear. Now this is the next step of Bible interpretation and translation. You now have to take that into your life and go, what does that mean to me? And maybe for you it means this week I'm going to serve someone that needs to be served. Someone less fortunate than me. Some, maybe it's a homeless shelter. Maybe it's, a, a, um, maybe it's an animal shelter. Maybe it's, it's something that is out of your comfort zone. I'm going to put my hands to work somewhere. And it, maybe it's just as simple as the person that you don't like at your job you're going to make an extra effort to show God's love to next week. Maybe it's that simple. Or maybe it's stepping out on faith. Maybe some of you are on the edge of going, God's been telling me to do something, and I've just been scared, and maybe it's taking that step. Maybe it's... Maybe it's volunteering here at, a, at this church. Or maybe it's volunteering for your community. Maybe it's uh, a neighbor that's having a rough time with their health and they need you to mow their grass. Something. Maybe it's a recommit to reading the Word and praying. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe we've gotten relaxed and we started worrying about our own affairs and we've stopped the praying every day. And we've stopped the studying and we've stopped trying to learn what God wants us to do. And maybe it's, that's going to be what I'm going to do this week. I'm going to make a plan and I'm going to either get up or if you're not an early morning person, before I go to bed, I'm going to read. Maybe it's, I'm going to write a prayer list and I'm going to pray over those things. Um, maybe it's a rededication of, of that. Maybe it's sharing your faith with someone for the first time. Maybe it's stepping out of that comfort zone and saying, God, I want to share with somebody what I believe, but I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know who, but send me somebody. Send me somebody that I can share it with. Maybe at work or maybe I'll run across somebody at the gas station. Whatever it is. So, renew your strength, remember His promise, rest in His Spirit, and refuse to fear. I want you to bow your heads and let's pray. Father, we're thankful for Your Word and how elegant and beautiful it is. We thank You for what we can learn and that you have taught us and you will continue to teach us the way you want us to live and how you want us to love and how you want us to serve. Lord, I pray this morning that your word will just resonate in our hearts 
and translate to our mind and into our hands that you would renew our spirit, our strength, rededicate our hands, help us to rest in your promise, help us to just allow you to lead us where we want to go. Now with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if, if this morning, nobody has to look around, but if this morning there's a, somewhere in your life that this message spoke to you, and there's, what, I, what I'm asking you to do here is to make a specific choice right now and say, this week I am going to A or B. Or maybe I'm going to do A, B, C, and D. Um, but if, if th this message spoke to you, just raise your hand up and I'll pray that God will, will lead us in a way this week to to just do what he's calling us to do. You can put your hands down. Father, we're so grateful this morning that your word speaks and that your word touches. Lord, we ask this morning that you know each of our hearts in this place. And even if we didn't raise our hand, you know what we're struggling with. You know what we're thinking about. Lord, I pray that you would keep this message in our minds this week. Allow us to put our faith into our hands that we could be your hands and feet to this world. And that you could use us in the way, in a mighty way like you've called us to do. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.